Good morning, brethren, Church of the Living God. Hello. 10.46 a.m. my time here in glorious, glorious Woodtuck, Illinois. Woodstick, Woodchuck, whatever you want to call it. Recently had our our best friend, our dearly beloved brother, uh, Alexander Hartley, join us here for a couple of days, a few days actually. And we were it was beautiful, able to have fellowship and um, just enjoy one another, enjoy the Lord and enjoy each other um, while he stayed with us and, um, and what a what a wonderful time it was praise the Lord and uh, also too because of that you know I, I kept in contact with uh, some of the brethren obviously but uh, because of that I haven't really been on uh, YouTube uh, too much at all actually so and boy some things have happened <laughs> Wow anyway Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Turn with me in the authorized version of the scriptures to Proverbs 26. It's God's fault? Hmm. It's God's fault, huh? Hmm. Interesting. Proverbs chapter 26. We want verses 4 and 5 to start. Please follow me along in your authorized version of the scriptures. And I'm going to address you as though you are, okay? Got it? Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. A very neat and appropriate way to begin a video of such nature. Answer not a fool who says in his heart, there is no God, according to his folly, to his error, to his ways. Answer not a fool. Answer not someone who says in their heart, there is no God, according to his folly, on his level, his way. Okay? According to his error. Lest thou be, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool, who says in his heart there is no God, according to his folly, his error, his mischief, that kind of stuff, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Mm. We are not to recompense evil for evil, or railing for railing. And of course, I myself, I am guilty of doing that, answering a fool according to his folly. I, I'm, hello, I am as guilty as the next man, okay? But we as the church of the living God, we are admonished not to do so, okay? Obviously. Because, especially, you know, a good example are these devils here on YouTube and on other platforms whose sole purpose is to pry, to gnaw, and to pick, okay? And they want to get you off of track to pay attention to them and... In their little pea brains, remember these devils have pea brains. If they can divert you from truth, if they can make you go down to their level and get angry with them, then they have won a victory in their little pea brains. Okay? But also, too, okay, that we already know that, but also, too, answer not a fool according to his folly. It's one thing when dealing with these coadjutor Jesuit devils pond scum, okay? It's one thing dealing with them. It's another thing kind of entirely when dealing with these evolutionists who are so cute, who are so wise in their own eyes, who think they're being clever, who like, who will actually quote to you scripture and try to turn the tables on us as the church of the living God. For an example, I have uh, more recently have come into contact through um, some people who have shown me some things about these evolutionary devil people who will bring up arguments. Well, okay, and this is what they do. According to you, you say that God knows everything. God is omniscient, omnipotent. He knows all. He's everywhere. So then when it comes to sin, God knew that Satan was in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? So hence, it's God's fault that sin is in the world. Hence, 
Man doesn't have a choice. As if they were Calvinists. And they will quote to you scripture. Not, not a Bible. They will quote unto you scripture even. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Have you, have you ever encountered any of that before? The, hopefully this video will be a good rebuke and uh, admonition. An admonition for the Church of the Living God and for you devils out there. Oh, it's God's fault. <laughs> God's, it's God's fault for sin being in the world. We're going to refute this erroneous, foolish argument. But on that, go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, we want chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. This uh, set of scriptures, as you saw, is a facsimile copy of the 1611. Written in Roman font, not Gothic, unfortunately. So uh, it's not really broke in, so I'm kind of breaking it in. So if I uh, seem a little uh, slow, um, remember uh, this is written in... Well, here, let me give you, a, give you a look. See? See that? Okay. So 2 Timothy chapter 2. We want verses 23 on to verse 24. Actually... Actually, let's read from verses 22 on to verse 26, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 on to verse 26. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness. Faith, charity, which is self-sacrifice, peace, uh, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. A pure heart is a heart that belongs unto the Lord. A pure heart is a broken heart. Okay? So, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Hold your place here and go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, we want chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes, like I said, bear with me, brethren. This, uh, this set of scriptures is not broken in. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from thy flesh. Why? For childhood and youth are vanity. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And right here, Paul is admonishing Timothy. Go, to, go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, picking up at verse 22 again. Flee also youthful lusts. Now stop right there. A youthful lust. Right away, what do we think of? Youthful, youthful lusts. Going after flesh, like uh, going after women, or if you're a woman, going after men. You think of the sexual angle on that, don't you? But it's a little bit deeper than that. See, with youthful people, it's generally, and this is, this is true <laughs> when you think about it, youthful people seem more um, apt to fight, to fight back. For example, uh, when you're a teenager, they call those the rebellious years, do they not? And I also know from experience and also that I was once a 20-year-old myself. Um, it seems that with people who are within their 20s and stuff like that, how come is it, let me put it to you this way, it seems that a lot of 20-year-olds out there seem that they know everything, right? Just like some teenagers. I remember the uh, my old employer on his refrigerator, he said to, hey, you kids, move out, get a job, do things your own way while you still know everything. And Paul says, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, 
Charity, which is self-sacrifice. Peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Uh, you know why the Jesuits are going after the youth? Because a lot of the youth out there are ready, more able, and um, apt to begin quarrel. Not all the time, okay? There are some of the Church of the Living God who are in their 20s, who, um, of course, because they have the Lord living within them, okay, they mortify. They put down, they mortify the flesh. But the average 20-something teenager out there, oh, boy! Oh, boy! <laughs> oh, boy! Yeah! Yeah! And as we saw in uh, um, Ecclesiastes, they run after the lust of their eyes, and uh, they follow their heart. And what about the heart? That it's dis dis deceitful and desperately wicked above all things? Yeah. See, it's a youthful thing. It shows a youthful thing to constantly be in strife and to be um, combative constantly. We are to contend for the faith, yes. But see, you see this also demonstrated a lot in the devils here on YouTube and on other platforms when they uh, resort to childish tactics as if they are on a schoolyard or something like that. You see youthfulness in our enemies because they behave like teenagers, little kids. And Paul tells us to flee from those things. And one of those things that they do is, you know, it's not our job to answer every question, brethren. But they'll ask you a question and you'll be like, you know, I'm not going to answer that. You don't want to hear it. It's like, you, you're you not answering because you can't answer it. Yeah. Let's continue. But foolish. What is foolish? Fool has said in his heart there is no God. To be foolish is to behave, act as if there is no God. Okay? Also to think as if there is no God. Okay? But foolish... And unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Youthful lusts, foolish and unlearned questions. Now, when it comes to babes in Christ, that's a different story. I mean, yes, they a babe in Christ, genuine, uh, genuinely, that does not know, asking someone who ought to know, that's a totally different thing. And we as the Church of the Living God, when we are in those situations, you have to have grace. Okay? You have to be patient with these people, with our brethren like that, especially the babes. Okay? They're going to ask questions like, oh, you don't know? Oh, you're, oh, you're a babe? That's fine. It's fine. It's okay. The, the dumbest question that is the one that isn't asked when it comes onto a babe in Christ. Okay? But, okay? But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. A foolish and unlearned question. Well, isn't God the reason why sin is in the world? And you see verse 22 and 23 are intrinsically linked together. The foolish and unlearned questions tied in with youthful lusts. Want to get even, right? Want to prove yourself that you're right, that you know everything, huh? Hey, I was once 20, in my 20s too. And I can remember I was lost back then, of course. But, oh, as a 20-year-old man, oh, I was horrible. Absolutely horrible. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance, to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive, who are taken captive by him at his will. And go to Second Peter now. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter three, verses three on to verse seven. And see, this is the kind of stuff that you and I as the Church of the Living God are going to be encountering even more so in these last days uh, coming close to the redemption of the purchased possession. Okay, We are going to be encountering more of these foolish and unlearned questions. Okay, 
You're going to be encountering these people who will quote to you the scriptures thinking that they're cute, thinking that they're so clever and smart, thinking that they, aha, they got you. We're going to be encountering a lot of that here in these last days, brethren. We need to be prepared and ready armed for these things. But we need to keep certain things in mind, okay? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 on to verse 7. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. <laughs> yeah, right? That's a scoffer. Yeah, right. Walking after their own lusts. Scoffing at the truth. Asking questions just to bring about strife and debate. Asking questions that are foolish and unlearned. Not wanting to uh, learn truth or know truth. Okay? You will run into that from time to time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I run into it quite a bit. Okay? But walking after their own lusts. Because they are their own God. Aren't they? Their eyes are open. And they, are, they shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yeah. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. <laughs> yeah, you keep telling me that there's going to be a catching away, huh? Where, where's this God of yours, huh? Nothing has changed, actually. You know, things have gotten worse. For this, they, for this, they willingly, purposely, are ignorant of. They don't want to know. They don't want to know the truth. They are scoffers walking after their own lusts, scoffing at the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, scoffing at the scriptures, while themselves actually quoting to you scripture and not a Bible. There's a difference. Okay. For this they willingly are ignorant of. What do they say? Ignorance is bliss, right? They, they don't want to know, and they are happy to be that way. They don't know better, and they don't want to know better. Why is that? Because they're walking after their own lusts. For this they willingly are ignorant of. And by the word of God, lowercase w, by the way, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old? What does that mean? By the word of God? Meaning that in the word of God, the authorized version of the scriptures, it has told you how things came to be. See right there, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Telling you that, hey... You want to know how things began? It's in the scriptures. You want to know the truth? It's in the scriptures. Okay? You got to remember, the scriptures are very scientific, demonstrable, provable, mm -hmm. observable, obviously. Look outside your door. Look at a leaf. Look at the retina of an eye. Hmm? And that came into being over millions and billions of years? You're crazy. But that that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Meaning the word of God declares unto you truth. How things began. How things got here. And what is to come. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now. By the same word. Lowercase w meaning the scriptures. Are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Of ungodly men. See, verse 5 on to verse 7 here is telling you that you want, you want answers? It's in the scriptures. By the word of God, the authorized version of the scriptures. You want the truth? Here it is. You want to know what's coming? Here it is. Okay? Here it is. Peter here, through the Holy Ghost, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is declaring that the scriptures declare these truths unto us. Sanctify them by thy truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? Now go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. So, we are to flee youthful, uh, youthful lusts 
and to avoid foolish and unlearned questions, knowing that in the last days there will be scoffers walking after their own lusts who are willingly ignorant or willfully ignorant. Yeah. They don't want to know. So we know this, okay? So now, 1 Peter chapter 3, we want verses 8 on to verse 16. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, answer not a fool according to his folly. But contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. How do you bless those who curse you? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Give them truth. That's how you bless those who curse you. That's how you love your enemies, by giving them truth from Scripture. That's how you show love today. Because remember, if you don't love someone, especially an enemy, okay, you don't warn them of the truth. You just, okay, fine. Now remember, and we're going to look at this in uh, Titus. If someone rejects, a, you know, first and second admonition, they don't want the truth, reject them. Okay? They have been warned. All right? Remember that. They have been warned. But we show love unto our enemies by telling them truth, by warning them of the cliff that they're running headlong for. Okay? We bless those who curse us by giving them truth, by walking our talk, by living as an example, you know, being an ambassador for Christ, you know, having the word of reconciliation as well as the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. And who are righteous? but the ones that our Lord declares righteous by washing them in his blood, okay? Coming to, them broke, coming to him broken, contrite, and in fear of him, calling upon his name, okay? Having faith on our Lord Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And when you come to him on his terms, he washes you in his blood, and you are declared righteous by his righteousness, not your own. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, those who are saved, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. I'm right here. Check this out. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, have you ever heard of that thing called apologetics? Jesuit term and phrase that it is. You ever heard of that? Like that that uh, adulterous guy, uh, what's his, what was his name? Ravi Zacharias, he was considered an apologist. I hate that word. What, we're to apologize for the faith? No. But see, there are those that will come to verse 15 and try to tell you and teach you that as the church of the living God, or in their terminology, what they like to say, as a Christian, you have to be ready to answer every question that's given to you. No, no. We are to avoid foolish and unlearned questions. Questions that cause strife and debates. Okay? We are not, brethren, okay? We are not supposed to answer every single solitary question that comes to us. Okay? What we are to give an answer for is 
Be ready and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I'll give you an example. All this, you know, this Jesuit uh, psychological operation that's going on. You run, uh, uh, run into someone who'll be like, how, how can you stay calm during all this? How, how come you're not afraid? How come you don't want to know? Hmm? What is it with you? Why? Why? I have the Lord Jesus Christ living within me. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And the blessed hope, which is the resurrection of the dead, the redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away, okay? Our time is ending. And we are when we are absent with the body, we are present with the Lord. We are going to be with our Lord Jesus Christ forever. You, lost person, what do you have? Death, hell, and the grave. See, give a reason of the hope that is in you. Looking for the blessed hope, the redemption of the purchased possession. But the hope that one day we are going to be with Jesus. One day we are going to have a body that doesn't ache us or pain us or has cancer in it. No. Oh. No, we are to give, we are, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Reason of the hope that is in you. Not answer every man, every question that they ask you. Keep that in mind, brethren. Okay. And besides, these so-called apologists, they were trained by Jesuits. Yeah. Let's continue. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Answer not a fool according to his folly. See? Okay. And of course now, let's go to Titus. Titus chapter 3, verses 8 on to verse 10. Uh, 8, 8 on to verse 11, excuse me. Titus chapter 3, verses 8 on to verse 11. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Good works. Remember, we are saved unto good works, to be ambassadors for Christ, having the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation, okay? God doesn't save you just to sit idle waiting to be redeemed. No, no. And we're not doing works to save ourselves. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, of course, got to go there and uh, touch on this. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 unto verse 10. For by grace are ye saved. By his grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works. What works? The works of the law. Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, his workmanship, a new creature. Okay? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Walk your talk, okay? See, God does not save you just so you can sit there idle. No. You are an ambassador for Christ. You have the word of reconciliation. You have the ministry of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled also, okay? Go back to Titus chapter 3. Picking up, on to ver uh, picking up at verse 8 again. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Not to be saved, not to stay, stay, stay saved. We are called thereunto, okay? These things are good and profitable unto men. But here it is again. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. I always find it so interesting that those who want to bring up contentions about the law are those who are lost. 
Muslims, evolutionists, speaking of things they don't know, things they can't possibly understand because they are, natu they are natural men, not born again, okay? I always found that very interesting. And, you know, when you run into people like that, these people who are evolutionists and like to quote to you the law and they have no concept of being uh, dispensational, you know, rightly dividing the word of truth, these are foolish questions. And trust me, you will be able to discern them. You will be able to discern them, okay? You'll know when someone is genuinely wanting to know truth and seeking truth and they come to you, it's like... Well, I read, what about this? Or, hey, how, how do you explain God allowing people to get killed? Or, or, or how do you explain this or that? See, you'll be able to discern, brethren, those who are genuinely seeking truth, who want to know truth, as opposed to those who just want to put forth their own agenda, serve their own purposes, you know, light their own candle, that kind of thing. Verses 10 and 11. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Why? Knowing that he is that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself, because he's his own God, or she's her own God. So see, after the first and second admonition, reject and move on to the next one. <laughs> I, brethren, don't get caught up in these foolish questions. Because what can happen is, and what will happen, <laughs> at least this has happened with me, okay, in an email. Um, and I'm not talking about brethren. I'm talking about these others, okay? They'll ask you a question. And, you know, go about in scripture to email them back their answer. And then, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? They keep coming. They keep coming with other angles trying to asking you virtually the same question, which you already painstakingly answered through the scriptures. But it's like, wait a minute. You're, you're giving me the runaround. You don't want to know truth. You just want to put forth your own agenda and suit your own purpose, trying to get one another notch in your belt or whatever it is. Put these people away, brethren. Okay? And we're going to be running into a lot of this. Remember, brethren, I spare you, it's not our job to take this and bat, 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 beat people over the head. I spare you. I spare you. I've done that before. I've done that before to my shame. Nor is it our job to take the scriptures and ah, cram it down somebody's throat. Okay, we're to give a reason to of the of the hope that is in us to every man who asks of us. The reason of the hope that is in us, not answer all these foolish questions. Okay, especially when you get these evolutionist people, who um uh, like like a dearly dearly beloved sent me um a screenshot of some fool evolutionist guy blaming God for sin, and she she did the right thing. You know, one two, you're out of here. I'm, I'm done with you, you know. you got to watch out for these people because we are going to be encountering a lot more of that as time goes on, as we continue closer and closer to the redemption of the purchased possession, okay? But now, go to the beginning. Go to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 on to verse 31. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 on to verse 31. Now, like I said, it's God's fault for sin being in the world. And as, uh, as the dearly, our dearly, dearly beloved sent me that uh, screenshot thing about this individual who was blaming God. And he used, he quoted scripture. He quoted scripture, not a Bible. He quoted, uh, quoted scripture, right? But he's like, well, okay, you say that God knows everything, that God's omnipotent, omnipresent, and nothing goes past him, right? And, yeah, right. So then, did 
Garden of Sigmas and Garden of Eden? Yes, he did. So, but then God allowed it, right? Yes, he did. So then, in essence, essence, it's God's fault. See, that's an argument similar that, it's kind of similar to Calvinism in a way because it's taking free will out of the picture. Man has free will. God does not hold you at gunpoint forcing you to do anything. Neither doth Satan hold you at gunpoint forcing you to do anything. You have free will to choose. Calvin teaches you, elect a non-elect. You're going to heaven without anything, what, because we are saved by grace through faith, but you're going to heaven without a choice of the matter. You're going to hell without a choice of the matter. Elect and non-elect. This individual that I'm referencing to, or referring to that uh, um, our dearly, dearly beloved encountered, he was basically saying the same thing. Basically, that it's God's fault that sin is in the world and that man has no choice. Man has no choice. And he tied it into original sin or she, but man doesn't have a free will. Man doesn't have choice. Even, even the easy believism devil heretics, even they would be like, oh, well, wait a minute, no, you have free will. And that's true. Man has free will. See, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is so powerful that he has given us the ability to say yea or nay. Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 on to verse 31. And God said, Let us make man in our image, spirit, soul, and body. I already have a video on this, addressing this. Uh, if I remember, I'll put it in the description box of this video. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In our image, after our likeness, spirit, soul, and body. We as man, we have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. God is spirit, soul, and body. The Holy Ghost, the Father, and the Word made flesh. Okay? These three are one, spirit, soul, and body. That's what that means. Like I said, if I remember, I, I think I will remember it. <laughs> I'll put the video in the description box where we talk about this, okay? Let's, let's continue now. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, again, very quickly, if it was in his actual countenance, like his face and stuff like that, then how come we don't all look the same? <laughs> so God created man in his own image, spirit, soul, and body. In the image of God created he, him, spirit, soul, and body. Male and female created he, them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. So, on that one very quickly, verses 29 on to verse 30, you can make a very good and valid argument that man, as well as beasts and creeping things, that man was originally created vegan. You can make a very, very good, reasonable argument for that. This is before the fall, okay? When everything was perfect, before man messed it up, okay? 
before man chose to sin against the Lord. Okay? This is earth in its infancy, at its pristine form. Okay? Yes, you can make a very valid argument that man was created, in fact, vegan. Okay? Honey, butter, that kind of stuff. But man at the beginning, yes, was to live off of plants, trees, and stuff like that. Not eat meat and flesh and that kind of stuff. You can do that today, obviously, obviously. But at the beginning, it was not so. Like I said, you can make a very valid, very valid argument that man at the beginning was in fact created vegan. You could make that argument. Let's continue. Verse 31. And God saw everything that he made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Six, number of man. Okay? Now, let's read in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 under verse 17. Okay? Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 under verse 17. We see in Genesis chapter 1 that God blesses man. Like, be fruitful and multiply. Eat of the trees. Go ahead. I've given it all to you. Even the, bur uh, even the beasts and the creeping things. Eat of the trees. It's, it's meat for you. It's your food. Go ahead. Okay? So, here you have a smorgasbord to choose from. Okay? Choice. Denoting choice. He didn't specifically say yet not what fruit not to eat from. Not yet. But he's like in verse 28, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth. Every herb and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me. Go ahead. Take your pick. Choose. Choice. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 on to verse 17. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were two trees in the garden. Remember that. Don't forget that. Okay? Two trees. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah. There where, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is the there is Bedlam, and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia, and the name of the third river is Hittikiel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. See, look at this. I've given you a smorgasbord. There you have peaches, apples, pears, grapes, all this stuff to choose from. Go ahead. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. Get fat and flourish. Go ahead. Be fruitful and multiply. Go. Go. Choose that. Okay? But... Verse 17, the condition. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, very quickly, about verses 16 and 17. Man in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they saw God. We're going to look at that, okay? They could see God, okay? God walked in the garden, okay? We're, we're going to look at that, so don't worry about it, okay? They saw God. They had perfect communion, perfect relationship with God. There was no sin, okay? In the Garden of Eden, the very first dispensation of Scripture, okay? The very first was all 
works. Eat of the tree. Any tree. Go ahead. But, but, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. See, faith was not necessary in the very first dispensation in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because they could see God. They didn't need faith when they could see God. You did, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Okay? Or the uh, hope of things not seen. All right? Uh, instead of butchering that, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, very quickly. Okay? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Be talking about this in uh, later videos here coming up this week as well. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the, excuse me, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. First one again in Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what is faith. That's what is faith. Faith was not necessary in the Garden of Eden because they could see God. You have these twits who call themselves King James Bible believing Christians. <laughs> and they call themselves dispensational. They're what they're actually are hyper dispensationalists. See, a dispensation is determined by how one is made right with God. Okay? But you got these guys who say it's been faith alone from Genesis unto Revelation. They're lying to you. Okay? We just saw. Okay? Be careful of these easy believism devils saying that from the very beginning, from Genesis on to the end in Revelation, it's faith alone. That is not true. Faith was not necessary in the Garden of Eden because they could see God. Okay? So when you got, especially Mr. Elmer from New York, okay, when you got guys like that telling you it's faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation, calling themselves dispensational, but they're not, because a dispensation, like I said, is judged upon how man is made right within, okay? That's how you gauge a dispensation, okay? Grace is there in every dispensation. If it wasn't, we'd all go up like a puff, okay? So, again, you're the church of the living God, you know this, but share this with these, these people who will come to you with these kinds of questions, you know? These evolutionist freaks, okay? It was by works. They were given a commandment. You can eat all of that, just don't do that. That's a commandment. That's a work. Okay? Don't do that. You do that, you're going to be messed up. Okay? Faith was not necessary in the Garden of Eden. Do not forget that. Okay? Do not forget that. Now, go to Genesis chapter 3. Now, we're going to be reading verses 1 on to verse 5. Very familiar unto you, but this is meat for what we have to uh, go through for this. Now, remember, in verses 16 and 17 in Genesis chapter 2, this denotes what? Choice. Does it not? Free will. Look at verse 17. Okay? Look at verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. A smorgasbord, okay? Look at all that. Go eat that. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. See, they had a choice. Do what God said, or choose not to do what God said, and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you do that, you will die. Okay? See, they had a choice. They weren't forced. Okay? There was no force in the matter. They had free will to go choose the myriad of things that God had given them or to choose that one thing that he said not to do. And hence is the nature of sin, isn't it? Like, I've, like we've talked about before, you and I. Someone, you know, the red button thing? 
You can touch, uh, you know, that console, that computer thingy. Touch, you can touch all those buttons. But see that red button? Don't touch that red button. And what happens with the natural man because of our flesh, the, the uh, sin suit? <laughs> the sin suit, huh? We want to touch that red button, don't we? That's the natural thing to do. The unregenerate man who doesn't have the Lord within them. We want to do naturally what we are told not to do. And this is why, okay? This is why. But, like I said, it's a choice. It's a choice, dear friend, okay? Now, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 under verse 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. The serpent. Who is the serpent? The devil. Satan. Okay? The, now the serpent, Satan, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Satan is a created being. Satan is not omnipresent or omnipotent. He doesn't know everything. Okay? Satan is a created being. And he said unto the woman... Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And he knew. He knew what God said. But see, what does Satan first do? First thing he does. His first recorded words chronologically in scripture. Yea, hath God said. He questions what God said. And who is he talking to? He went to the woman. Where was Adam during all this? I don't know. We don't know. Very good discussion. Very good thing to contemplate. Okay? We don't know where Adam was. Hence, he was by herself. And wherever Adam was, he was by herself. Satan went after the woman, which is something Satan does. He goes after the weaker, weaker vessel. Because women, you have to remember, woman was made for man, not man for woman. Woman means of man, taken of man. That's what woman means, okay? So Satan went to the woman. And Adam was not there, surprisingly. Let's continue. And the woman said unto the serpent, Satan, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, Neither shall ye touch it. God did not say that. You look at verse 17. Show me where it says, neither shall ye touch it. Eve added unto the word. Lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. And here is the promise that Satan promises to all these wicked devils. And to all you lost people, you evolutionist freaks out there. You wicked devils, okay? Here's his promise to you. Here's what he offers you. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Who knows what is truly good and evil? Uh, that be the Lord, God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. But see, what Satan did was, now, first of all, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And in verse 17, God says, Thou shalt surely die. Now, did Adam and Eve die right away? No. But see, that's what Satan was working off of. See, as far as they knew, lest ye die, you disobey the Lord and eat the fruit of the tree that you're not supposed to eat of, that you're going to be an instantaneous death, uh, death, right? No, it was an eventual death, obviously, okay? Because Adam lived to be almost a thousand years old, remember, okay? He died eventually, gradually. Granted, too, uh, an animal had to die so that, uh, they, uh, that the Lord could give uh, Adam and Eve skins to cover their nakedness. Yes, an animal had to die, but they didn't die just like that. Okay? It took years and 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 years. And years okay? But see, Satan was going off of, you're not going to die right away. Huh? See, in verse 
4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. See, every one of us is going to give an account of ourselves unto God. We who are saved are the church of the living God. We get redeemed, the redemption of the purchase, purchase possession before the time of Jacob's trouble. You and I are the church of the living God. We know this. We are going to give an account of ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, at the judgment seat of Christ, where our works are going to be tried for our rewards in the kingdom of heaven and stuff like that. Lost people, they're going to give an account of themselves at the great white throne of judgment. Okay? At the end. Okay? For unto, one, unto men it is appointed once unto die. Unto men it is appointed to die once. And then the judgment, that's in Hebrews. I just bradized that. Beg your pardon, okay? But we die, then we are judged, okay? So death does not come instantaneously. It's a gradual death. But see, Satan, what he is working off of here, brethren, what he is working off of in verse 4 Ye shall not surely die. Not right away. You're going to die, but not right away. So, go ahead, live it up. This is your best life now. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, that's not your judgment. That's Don't worry about that. Now is the time. Right now. Live it up now. See? See? Oh, that they were wise that they would consider their latter end. And see, Satan wants to take your eyes off of that latter end and have you only focused on right now, okay? And granted, okay, sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. But we of the church of the living God, we know where we are going. We know what awaits us in our end, the judgment seat of Christ and to be, uh, you know, to be forever with the Lord, okay? We know that. You lost people? Especially you evolutionists, what do you have to look forward to right now? See? And they did die. Not right away. But see, like I said, that's what Satan was working off of. Because they thought, uh, Eve thought, it's like, if I touch, if I even touch it, I'm going to die, drop down dead. And Satan's like, you will not. But the death was not instantaneous. Keep that in mind. And then verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. There must be a reason why God doesn't want you to eat that one tree. He's given, never mind all the myriad of things he's given you. There, there, there got to be a reason, right? That he doesn't want you to eat that one, right? Go ahead and eat it. Now, the minute you disobey God, the minute you do that, right? Your eyes will be open. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Because God is the only one truly knows what is good and evil. But, but see, they chose through Satan's subtlety, not at gunpoint. They chose, Eve chose to disobey what God said. And then, of course, she gave the fruit uh, onto Adam and he ate with her and then everything boom, went kablooey, okay? But see, they chose to disobey what God said. Not at gunpoint, but they chose to disobey God. And that's what Satan offers. Do a contrary to what God says. Just go ahead and then you can judge what is right or wrong, not God. Because God's ways are right, perfect, fair, just, and equal. Man's ways. <clears throat> you can be your own God, judging what is good and evil. That's what Satan is offering when you disobey God. And when you think about it, what is sin? Sin is transgression of the law, right? And doesn't Satan make sin look so good, so beautiful, so pretty? Doesn't it? Verse 6, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it, was, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. 
and see verse 6. She saw that, what did she see? And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. See, Satan will make sin appear so beautiful. These evolutionists with their wisdom, <laughs> with their science, oh, they make you, they, they like to put off the, uh, the feel that they know so much. Oh, look at how wise they are. Look at how smart they are. They're fools. They say in their heart there is no God. See, evolution, evolutionary, the evolutionary mindset, the religion of evolution is Satan's religion. Just like Roman Catholicism, okay? It's Satan's religion, okay? Ezekiel chapter 28, okay? Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12, on to verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12, on to verse 19. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Looking good on the outside, right? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now hold on. Tyrus, the king, had not been in the garden of Eden. Garden of Eden, as it was known in Genesis, was destroyed in the flood. Okay? I know that there are some out there nowadays who like to say that they have found where Eden was. We, no one knows, okay? Because things were very different before the flood, okay? Very different, okay? Remember, the waters of the flood shaped the modern earth that we have today, okay? Okay? But before the flood, things were different. Eden was destroyed in the gar uh, the Garden of Eden was destroyed in the flood, okay? So, Tyrus could not have present tense have been in the Garden of Eden. Who is he talking to? The one who is working in Tyrus, controlling him, okay? We're going to see an example of this also in Matthew chapter 16, okay? Satan was the one who was manipulating, speaking through, working in Tyrus, okay? God, even though it's Tyrus, God is talking to Satan who is controlling Tyrus. Okay. Thou hast been in the Garden of Eden. Uh, thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of God. Okay. Tyrus was not. The serpent, who is Satan, was. Okay. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Tablets and pipes. Uh, I have heard, and so have you of the Church of the Living God, have heard this thing that Lucifer, Satan, was God's choir director. Uh, uh. The only place you can arrive at such is verse 13 in Ezekiel 28. And that's sketchy. That's sketchy. Tabrets and uh, pipes was prepared in the, in the day that thou was created. Okay? I have heard that argument about, well, Lucifer was God's choir director and verse 13 in Ezekiel 28, other than the apocryphal deuterocanical nonsense, okay, other than uh, the book of Enoch, which is not scripture, um, in scripture, the only verse you got to work on, on trying to support that, is Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13, and that's sketchy at best, okay, sketchy at best, interesting, but sketchy at best, but now hold your place there, Back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, who is Satan, was more subtle than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the serpent was in the garden of Eden. Tyrus was not in the garden of Eden. Satan was, the serpent. Okay. Now let's continue. 
And looking at verse 13 again, all those precious, bright, shining lights, bright stones were his covering. And also with the tabrets and pipes, the devil's music, with all the glamour, the glitz, you know, the rock shows with the strobe lights and stuff like that. Okay? Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Um, on this, I'm uh, going to look at this here at another, um, we have this written down in another portion here, but go to Job. Job chapter 1. Okay? Job chapter 1. Uh, a not broken in set of scriptures. We're working on that. <laughs> okay? And looking at verse 14 again in Ezekiel chapter 28, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, angels. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And also while we are here in uh, Job, uh, let's look at chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. See, Satan walks upon the earth too, okay? He's on the earth, walking to and fro, up and down on the earth, okay? He's not kicked out of heaven yet. He will get kicked out of heaven during the time of Jacob's trouble, but he's not kicked out yet, okay? He has to go to present himself before the Lord, just like every other created being does as well. Even Satan himself has to give an account to the Lord. Keep that in mind, okay? Now, go back to Ezekiel chapter 28. Picking up at verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. What was the iniquity in Lucifer? Satan. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out to the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He's captivated by his own beauty. Okay? Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So Satan's sin was pride. Satan knew that he was a good-looking creation. All those stones that covered him. He, was the, he is the son of the morning. Not the morning star. He is the son of the morning. Okay? Bright. Bright, shiny. All those stones covering him. Thine heart was lifted up. Pride. Pride was the sin of Satan. Okay? Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He was good looking and he knew it too. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And see that pride that is in Satan. Ye shall not surely die. Okay? Okay? Ye shall not surely die. But God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, your eyes will be open. You'll be able to see. 
ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll be able to chart, uh, chart your own course. You'll be able to make your own decisions, not be burdened by a book. That's what Satan offers all of you who have eaten of that apple, of that tree, of that grape, of that peach, of whatever. Okay? Those of you who have eaten the gifts of Satan, you're your own God. You judge what is right and wrong. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries, verse 18, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity, uh, by the iniquity of thy traffic. He's always moving, always diligent, always feverishly moving. Look at these devils here on YouTube and on other platforms as well. Look at the devils on the world. Look at how the Jesuits are doing with the all-seeing eye variant. Okay? Constantly busy. Constantly working. There is no peace unto the wicked. Okay? Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring thee forth Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. And in, what is it, Job chapter 41, I believe it is, where God talks about Leviathan, you know, fire-breathing dragon, fire coming out from the midst of thee. Okay? Uh, in Job chapter, what is that, uh, 41, yes, God is the Leviathan. That is a veiled reference of Satan. Okay? It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. See, the fire that comes out of Satan's mouth will eventually burn himself up. His destiny, his destination is ultimately the lake of fire, as well as all of you who follow him. Your destiny is the lake of fire. Unless the Lord save you and you come unto our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, on his terms, not your own. Okay? And of course, Isaiah chapter 14. Now, Church of the Living God, we have been through this countless times. Remember, and share this video with someone, uh, an evolutionist, that kind of nonsense, okay? If you, if you will, I mean, if, if that comes up, okay? We have to remember it. It's this kind of thing that we are going to be encountering further on as we go, okay? Don't forget that. And of course, Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 12 under verse 15. How art thou fallen from heaven? Fallen, not cast out. How art thou fallen from heaven? Oh, Lucifer, what does Lucifer mean? Son of the morning. Bibles? Well, instead of son of the morning, put morning star in there. You check the book of Revelation. Morning star, dear friend. Morning star is a title for Jesus Christ, God our Father. Jesus Christ is the bright morning star. So in a Bible... Like the NIV, New American Standard, the ESV, where they say morning star. They're saying that Jesus fell from heaven. Blasphemy. Okay. Satan. Oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. That's what Lucifer means. Son of the morning. Bright light. Okay. Son of the morning. That's why, that's why you need the scriptures and not a Bible. Okay. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nation through the multitude of his traffic and the, you know, his tabrets, his pipes and stuff like that? All oh, that brightness of his. Yeah. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yet, 
Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. See, here in uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, it always, when talking about Satan, it always is quick to remind us of his eventual destruction. In hell, they're like fire. Okay? And also, too, okay, I will be like the Most High. What did he promise? What did he, what did he offer on Eve? What did he promise Eve? Disobey God. Go against what he says. You'll be able to see and you can judge your own thing. You can be your own little God. You judge what is right and wrong. Not God. See? And you got to remember, son of the morning. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Not morning star. Okay? That's blasphemy. The Bibles say morning star. That's blasphemy, okay? That's why you need the authorized version of the scriptures, my friend. You reading anything else, it's a Bible given to you from Rome. You need the scriptures, okay? Now, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's start with verses 1 on to verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 4. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. See, and that's another thing that a lot of lost people is like, well, how can God be jealous? Whether you want to admit this or not, or accept it or not, God created you. You are a created being. You did not come here by millions and millions and trillions of years ago in a galaxy far, far away when puppies were the oldest animal. Okay, your great, 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 great ancestor was not a sniveling piece of snot that came out of the water, okay? No, no. You are created. You are creation. Whether or not you want to accept that means very little because you're going to give an account for your creator, whether at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne of judgment. Okay? So, God made you. God wants you to choose him. Okay? God wants you to choose him. You have a choice. Okay? He's not forcing you to serve him or to love him because that wouldn't be genuine, would it? Huh? It would be forced. It wouldn't be genuine. It would be a love brought about by force. And how is that a genuine love? Hmm? Hmm? So, God who created you, who wants you, who wants you to love him for what he is, for who he is, and when you as his creation... Give yourself over to Satan and his church, Mystery Babylon, the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, Roman Catholicism and her army, the Jesuit order. Yeah, yeah, he's jealous. He doesn't want you mingling with Satan. Okay? I know, a lot of lost people, um, how can God be jealous? Jealousy is a sin. You're his creation, whether you want to accept that or not. And you as an evolutionist, you're mingling with the, the Jesuits, with Satan, okay? You're not his, okay? <laughs> You're being warned. But yes, God is jealous. He wants you for himself, okay? And as creator, he has every right to be. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. 
another Jesus, another gospel. Dear friend, the simplicity of Christ, it is very simple. Come to the Lord on his terms. Come to him as a broken, contrite sinner. And in fear of the Lord, call upon, ask him to save you. And may he do so. Okay? It's very, very simple. See, but the hard part is that repentance. What are you repenting of? Your self-righteousness. See, Satan has instilled into you that you are your own God. That you can choose your own way, knowing what is good and evil. Hence, you're filled with, you're filled with pride. You're your own God. You're your own judge. So your self-righteousness needs to be squished. You need to be broken of that. Okay? And when you are broken of that, come to the Lord. And in your brokenness, godly sorrow, because it's your fault, you have sinned against the Lord. See, lost people will blame other people. That's a trait of lost people who will not take accountability for their own actions, will not take responsibility for themselves. No, it's someone else's fault. Okay, that's what lost people do. Those who are saved of the church of the living God, we own up because we know that we are a sinner who is chief. Okay? You come to the Lord broken of that self-righteousness, sorrowful because it's your fault, and fear because God has every right to put you in hell. And you deserve to go there. But see, if you come to him broken and contrite and being afraid of him because he has the right, can and will put you in hell, ask him to save you. Ask him for his forgiveness. And may he save you. And if he does save you, he seals you until the day of redemption. Once saved, always saved. It's not your salvation, okay? God dwells within you, okay? But see... Verse 3, but I fear lest by any means, as the, say, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. See, and these devils, they are thieves and robbers, okay? Easy believism heretics. The door is Jesus Christ. We have to go through the door, our Lord Jesus Christ. These devils want to, <laughs> I boot the door out of the way, and go up some other way. See, the easy believism heretic, believe and receive. Just believe. Just believe. You make a decision in your head to be saved, okay? Hence, you save yourself. That's not true salvation, okay? It's simple. Come to him broken and contrite, and in fear of the Lord you call upon his name and that he may save you. But see, these devils, they're the ones who are confusing it. Just believe. Just believe. What about repentance? What about broken? Ah, repentance is a work. <laughs> repentance is going from unbelief to belief. <laughs> the devils also believe and tremble. Okay? See, these devils are the ones who are making it complex, who are making it difficult. See, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You save yourself by your own belief. You're saved because there's something good within you. You're a good person after all. It's because you, Christ, died, right? Or even better, you gave up this, 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 and now you're worthy to go to Christ that he gives you repentance. See, easy believism, ecumenicalism, and lordship salvation, what is that? For if he that cometh preacheth, preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. See, easy believism, ecumenicalism, Lordship salvation, evolutionism, okay? That's another gospel. That's another Jesus, okay? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. And see, what Satan is doing, go to now to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. 
Daniel chapter 12. See, what he offered Eve was, your eyes will be open, knowing good and evil. He's offering what? He's offering a wisdom, but not the right wisdom. We'll get on, uh, more into that in a second. Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 on to verse 4. Daniel chapter 12, not Hosea, Brad, beg your pardon. Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 on to verse 4. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Wise, wisdom. Okay? What is wisdom? Wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and to depart from evil is understanding. Okay? Through wisdom, the fear of the Lord, you will receive knowledge. Okay? Through wisdom, the fear of the Lord, and having understanding, departing from evil, he will give you knowledge. Okay? True knowledge comes from our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, who dwells within us, who are of his church, the church of the living God, through the scriptures. See? Verse 3 in Daniel chapter 12. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run, note this, to and fro, just like Satan, and knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge, not wisdom. Knowledge shall be increased. Many shall run to and fro, just like their father Satan running to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Oh, there's a whole lot of knowledge out there, isn't there? There's a, there's a whole lot of knowledge out there, isn't there? Yeah, there sure is. Not a lot of wisdom. Wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And this close to the redemption of the purchased possession, knowledge is definitely increasing. And people are running to and fro, aren't they? Look at these devils here on YouTube. How busy they are. How fastidious they are. Okay. Look at the Christians. How busy they are, right? Right. Right. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Seven, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1. On to verse 3. Okay? Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. We all have knowledge. Knowledge is increasing. We all have knowledge. But is that knowledge based off of wisdom, the fear of the Lord, which the Lord gives you? Or knowledge that comes from the earth? Now, as touching things offered unto idols, yes, an idol is a little statue. Yes, it is. But an idol can also be other than just a little Mary statue, okay? Many things. Look at Satan. What, did it, what was his idol? Himself, his beauty, okay? Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity, self-sacrifice, edifieth. And I'll tell you what. <laughs> knowledge puffeth up. Have you ever had the chance to, I'm, I'm sure some of you have, but some of these evolutionists, they are some of the most puffed up, egotistical, arrogant people you'll ever want to meet. Talk down to you. Why? Because they've been trained by Jesuits. They have their PhDs. That's why I like guys like John MacArthur and uh, Pete Ruckman, I never really cared for. <laughs> never really cared for either of them. John MacArthur, he knows everything. There ain't a question that you can give him that he won't be able to answer. Same with Peter Ruckman. These guys knew way too much. Way too much. I don't think either of them are saved, obviously. Of course not. But, point is, 
They knew way, 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 way too much. When did Pete Ruckman ever say, well, I don't know. When did John MacArthur ever say, well, I don't know. Yeah. And what happens when that knowledge is there? People get puffed up. And if any man think, verse 2, and if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Good old Paul tying it back into wisdom. God, okay? Because, see, wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and to depart from evil is understanding. Job 28, 28. The wisdom that comes to us is the fear of the Lord. We will get knowledge through the scripture because we have the fear of the Lord. We have the church of the living God. We have God living within us, okay? And that wisdom that is within us, the fear of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, he will guide us into all truth, okay? The spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth, and the Lord is that spirit, okay? And this is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay? But see, what Satan offers, what Satan offers is James. Go to James. James. James chapter 1. Oh, James chapter 3. Excuse me. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. We want verses 13 on to verse 18. James chapter 3, verses 13 on to verse 18, the close of the chapter. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge amongst you? Wise, wise man. Who is a wise man? One who fears the Lord. And because you fear the Lord, you will be given knowledge. So, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge amongst you? Let him shew out of a Good conversation, his works with meekness of wisdom. Look at that verse. Don't look at me. Look at that verse. Okay? Who is a wise man? One who fears the Lord. What is a wise man? One who has wisdom. And endued with knowledge amongst you. Knowledge is the byproduct, if you will, of having the fear of the Lord. Okay? And if you have the fear, truly have the fear of the Lord in you, okay? If you truly have the fear of the Lord in you, <laughs> you will have knowledge, okay? He will give you knowledge. And those who, only those who are truly saved, born again and converted, truly have the fear of the Lord in them, okay? But who is a wise man and endued with knowledge amongst you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Walk your talk. Don't be a hypocrite. Okay? But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, these evolutionist people, they are, oh, do they start strife. Oh, boy, contention. Strife. Oh, and truckloads. Yeah. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, a wisdom that causes strife, envying, that puffeth up, okay? This wisdom descendeth not from above. It's not the fear of God. It's the fear of man. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Earthly, made of the earth. Okay? Remember, you and I, we were made of dirt. Okay? So, this wisdom descendeth not from above, not from God, but is earthly, comes from the earth, sensual, Led by your senses, your feelings. Devilish. And that's what Satan was offering. That's what he does offer. Okay? Your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. 
For where envying and strife is, there is confusion. God is not the author of confusion. And every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. The fear of the Lord is clean, pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Verse 13, who is a wise man and, in, and endued with knowledge amongst you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. See? And looking at verse 15, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but it earth is but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Matthew, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. See, Satan is all about flesh, all about man. Okay? And those who serve Satan, those who work for Satan, you know, the Vatican and the Jesuits, you know, these pond scum coadjutors, okay? Those who work for the devil, who are of the devil, mind, earthly, sensual, devilish things. They're all about flesh. They worship the skin suit. They're all about flesh. Why is that? Well, Matthew chapter 16, one verse. We, we just need to read one verse, okay? Matthew chapter, oh, whoa, whoa, Brad, you, you. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, okay? Now, the context is, okay, our Lord Jesus ta uh, Christ talks about, you know, um, upon this rock I will build my church, talking about himself, okay? Catholics like to say that's when he made Pope Peter, Pope Peter, Boom, that's nonsense, okay? But, Peter, upon, you know, according to Catholicism, uh, they say Peter was given the keys of heaven. He's the first pope and all that stuff. But then Peter, when uh, our Lord Jesus Christ starts talking about, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scripture. Now, some will tell you that they were looking forward to the cross all the way in Genesis. Just like they will say, it's faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation. If if they would have been looking forward to the cross, Peter would not have done this. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. But he, Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. Now hold up. He said Satan. He just called Peter Satan. Very similar to what we looked at about Tyrus in Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay? Our Lord was addressing who? Satan. Okay? Guess what? Peter was not a saved man here. <gasps> Peter was not converted. <gasps> Peter was never a pope. <gasps> okay? So Jesus just referred to Peter as Satan. You got to remember, Peter was not a saved man at this point. Neither was he converted. And, and in Luke chapter 22, our Lord says unto him, Shimon, Shimon, Satan hath desired to have thee, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Okay? Satan desired to have Peter. And in name only, Satan's got Peter. In name only, not in truth. Okay? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. If they were looking forward to the cross, Peter wouldn't have said in verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. Be it far from thee. From thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. If they were looking forward to the cross, why did Peter say that? 
And we're looking forward to the cross all the way back in, in Genesis, okay? Even though the cross is prophesied, it wasn't revealed until years and years and years and years and years later, okay? Now, back in verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Why? For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men, of man. See, those who work for Satan, those who are of Satan, whose father is the devil, they mind earthly, sensual, devilish things. They savor not the things that be of God. They savor the things that be of man. They're all, you're all about flesh. Hence, evolutionists. Okay? Now, go back to Genesis chapter 3. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Okay? Genesis chapter 3. We will be picking up now Genesis chapter 3. Let's pick up now at verses, verse 14, okay? Now, this is after they had eaten the tree, uh, eaten the fruit of the tree and whatnot. And what did Adam and Eve do? Let's read this. Let's read this. Let's pick up from verse 6, okay? In uh, Genesis chapter 3. Let's pick up at verse 6, all right? And when the woman saw that it, the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. See, before they were in the presence of the Lord naked without any shame because they were innocent. But they disobeyed. They chose to disobey God. They made the choice. Okay? Satan didn't force Eve. Eve didn't force Adam. Okay? They chose to sin. They chose to disobey God. And in doing so, they knew they were naked and they were ashamed. Okay? And they heard, now verse 8, verse 8 is very special here. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. How does a voice walk unless he has a body? See, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Walking. A body walks. You, you look in Genesis chapter 1, the spirit moved across the waters. It doesn't say walked. Here it says walked. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. See, Adam and Eve saw God. How do you prove that? You look at that verse. How does a voice walk unless a voice has a body? The Word made flesh. See, God is spirit, soul, and body. Adam and Eve saw God with their eyes. Okay? He walked in the garden. Okay? Faith was null and void because they could see God. Okay? Comprende? Let's continue in this. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now, these cute, brilliant evolutionists will say, God knows everything, right? Yes, he does. Well, why was he asking where he was? Didn't he know? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Let's, let's continue there, Hacha. Okay? And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? It's like, I know where you are. Come on. Where are you? Come on. Come on. I know where you are. Why are you doing this? Okay. 
And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So God was, oh, Who told you? No, no. God knows everything. God is omnipotent, omniscient. He lives outside of our time. Time is nothing unto our Lord, okay? What was going on here? Well, God knew where Adam was. God knew what had happened. God, who is fair, just, and equal. God was giving Adam a chance to come clean. See, God was giving Adam the chance to choose to do what was right. He already done messed up. But see, God was giving Adam the choice, the chance to do what was right. God was giving Adam a choice. He called him. It's like, hey, come on, where are you? I know where you are, but come on. And then he's like, and I and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Gave it away. God already knew. And God here in verse eleven, and he said, Who told thee? Okay, wanted him to implement Satan. Okay, that thou was naked. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? If God didn't know that, then God didn't know everything, right? Right? But God did know everything. God does know everything. So how do you reconcile that? Simple. God was giving him a chance. God was giving him a choice. God was giving Adam the chance to repent and to come clean. See, if God didn't do that, he wouldn't be fair, just, and equal. See, you atheists, you wicked uh, evolutionists, you don't know God. The God you know is the one you look in the mirror, at, at in the mirror. The God you're going to know is the little G God, Satan. Okay? You don't know who God truly is. Okay? If God didn't give an opportunity to Adam to repent, to come clean, then he wouldn't be fair, just, and equal, would he? Would he? Come on, lost people! Okay? Would he? He wouldn't be fair. He wouldn't be a fair God if all of a sudden, if he didn't give him that chance. Would he? No, he wouldn't. But God is fair, just, and equal. And Adam had a choice. See, presented to him a choice. Verse 11, and he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Who told you that? I know who, but... You tell me. You do what's right. You, cho you chose to sin against me. You choose to do what's right. See? Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? You did wrong. You chose to do wrong. Now you choose to do right. I know, I know the answer here. I want you to do what's right. Choose to do what is right. What does Adam do? Just like all lost people, those who claim they are saved, but yet it's someone else's fault. I was manipulated. I'm a mindless robot who has no control over my own spirit. I'm a slave. No, you're a servant. Or are you a slave? Yeah. What did Adam do? And the man said, the woman, the woman how, whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree. And yeah, I did eat. Don't look at me. Look at that verse. Okay. Look at that verse. We, me, me and you of the Church of the Living God have talked about this in depth before. I'm not directly speaking on to you of the Church of the Living God. This is for you lost people. Okay? What you are seeing here is called the old man or the Adamic nature. Okay? Making excuses. Not taking accountability or responsibility. Or he did, but half-heartedly. What did he do? 
He blamed the woman. It's the woman's fault. But it's your fault because you're the one who gave it to me. See? So, God knew Satan was in the garden. Yes, he did. But see, God gave man free will to choose because if there is no choice, then you are a robot. Love is coerced. See? Obedience is coerced. All right? And God is not a God of coercion, but of peace. Okay? So, free will is there to choose. Okay? He gave them all that stuff in the garden. Just don't eat that one. Satan comes along and tempts Eve. She falls for it. Goes, takes the fruit, eats it, gives it to Adam and Eve. Here we are today. Okay? All right? A choice was given. And they chose to do evil. They chose to disobey. And because now they had, in actually disobeying, sin came into the world. Okay? All right? And because of that, because of that, man is born a sinner. Okay? But see, even in the fact that you are born a sinner, you still have the chance, the opportunity to choose. Okay? Not coerced at any point. Okay? But he ultimately blamed God. It's God's fault for sin? No. God gave man free will. And man made the choice to sin. Hence, man, because of Satan's subtlety, yes, but man... You look at this text. In Genesis chapter 3, show me coercion. Show me at force. It's not there. It's not there. Why? Because man chose. Man chose. You have free will. And guys like Calvin and this idiot, an idiot is someone who is void of logic and reason, okay? And this idiot evolutionist whatever that our dearly, dearly beloved sister ran into, Okay, who is an idiot trying to rob people of free will while quoting scripture? Oh, they're so cute. No, 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 no. Man has free will. Man has free will. And in that free will, instead of taking the instead of taking accountability and responsibility, Adam, the woman that you gave me indirectly, it's your fault, God. If you hadn't given me this woman, if you hadn't given me this woman. I wouldn't have done this. Yeah, I yeah, I did mess up. But see, it's because of you. Which was the exact argument of this imbecile? <laughs> well, God knew that Satan was in the Garden of Eden. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So, indirectly. Yeah, indirectly. It's God's fault for sin. Because God allowed it. God did not force these people. God did not force Adam and Eve to choose sin. Satan did not chew, uh, force Adam and Eve to choose sin. Okay, God knew what was going on. But see, he gives us free will. And in that free will, Adam, Adam blew it. Adam blew it. Okay? God gave him the chance to choose to do what was right. God knew what happened. God knows what's going to happen. Okay? But he has given us free will. Okay? A robot who loves doesn't love out of its own choosing, but because it is programmed. A love that is coerced is not true love. Okay? And Adam, it's your fault. It's the woman who you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and yeah, of course I eat. I ate. So, yeah. And oh, how often do you run into this? And how often, brother, sister, how often do you struggle with this within yourself? You want to blame other people, don't you? But see, you have the church of the living God. You know you can't. You can't blame other people. It's your fault. It's your fault. 
We can't blame others. We can only blame ourselves. And see, that's what God was giving Adam the chance to do. And Adam didn't take it. And let's keep reading. Okay? Verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman. Okay. God's like, you blew it. I'm going to go to the one who I made for you. Giving the woman the chance now to man up, as it were. Okay? Adam blew it. Adam, the covering. Adam, the husband, the head of the wife. Where was he when Satan was tempting his wife? We don't know. Where was he? I don't know. Okay? Where was he? When Eve came to Adam with that fruit, okay? Because Paul talks about it was Eve who was in the transgression. It was Eve who was deceived, okay? Adam, as the head, when Eve came with, to him with that fruit of the tree, Adam should have been like, what are you Knock it out of her hand. What are you doing? What have you done? No. That's what Adam should have done. Okay. Now, you can make the, you can debate about this all you want. And look in the scripture about debate. But, I mean, you can ponder it. Um, there are those who say, well, Adam chose to die with his wife. That's why he ate. Or, because Eve sinned and through subtlety, Maybe Eve tricked Adam? We don't know. We don't know. I personally am under the belief that there was a little seduction and deception going on that Adam was kind of duped, okay? Because Paul says it, uh, Adam was not in the transgression. It was Eve, okay? And that's where those who point to that uh, Adam chose to die with his wife, okay? And, you know, you can also back that up with they two will be one flesh, you know, leave mother and father and be joined unto their wife. Like I said, that's kind of a, that's an interesting topic, but the point is regardless. The point is regardless that when Eve came to Adam with that fruit, he should have knocked it out of her hand and been like, whoa, stop. What have you done? But he didn't. He didn't. He should have done that. Eve should not have listened to Satan. Satan didn't force it. She chose to do it. Okay? But God was like, okay, Adam, I gave you this choice, this chance to do what was right. You chose not to. So he goes to the woman, and what does she do? And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? Okay, I offered it to your husband. He blew it. Come on. You tell me what I already know. And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. The devil made me do it, and I did eat. Now, remember in Matthew chapter 16 that Satan savoreth not the things that be of God, but be of man? Why is that? Genesis chapter 13, verse 14, okay? And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Satan, because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat and eat all the days of thy life. Thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And look at verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Satan savoreth not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. And he is cursed to go upon his belly and eat dust all the days of his life. And you and I, man, we are dust. Get it? And for you evolutionists out there, verse 14 and the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. You evolutionists ought to know this. You know, on the butt end of a snake, there are like two holes in the skeletal thing of a snake to where at one time there might have been legs. 
Oh, but that's a thing of evolution. No, that's a result of the curse of the garden in the Garden of Eden. That the serpent was cursed to go upon his belly and eat dust. Those two things in the butt end of a snake that show that at one time they might have had legs. Serpent, here in context, does not necessarily mean the slithering snake as you and I know it. Keep that in mind. Okay? Keep that in mind. But go to 2 Corinthians now, chapter 2. Just one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we want verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. What are Satan's devices? This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Satan's devices has everything to do with earthly, flesh, sensual, senses, your feelings. which is what Christians want. They want a God who is earthly, sensual. They're going to get a God who is devilish, that man of sin, the son of perdition. Oh, absolutely. Because these people, who is their father? These evolutionists, these Jesuits, these, uh, these, these Christians, okay, in the church buildings, who is their father? Uh, go to John. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verses 44 and verse 47. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. And what was the lust of uh, Satan? Anything that would suit himself, that would make himself look good. Pride. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Why? Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. Yeah. Why? For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. See, you need to get saved before you at all try to attempt to expound anything of the scripture. I mean, you look at these easy believism, Jesuit, pond scum, coadjutors here on YouTube, them trying to teach. Oh, wow. Oh, why? They're, they're natural men. Okay, they're going off of what their father teaches them through their, through uh, Mystery Babylon's army, the Jesuit order. Okay. Oh, it's gut wrenching. Okay? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. And then when we of the church of the living God encounter these foolish and unlearned questions and try to tell them the truth, it goes in, okay? Usually. And they take you in circles, going round and round and round and round, causing strife and debate. Right. Now, and verse 44, ye are of your father the devil. Who is the devil? Satan, Lucifer. But what is the significance of uh, Lucifer? What is he unto this world, huh? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. See, Satan is the little G God of this world. I'm going to prove that to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 under verse 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, and dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the God, word of God deceitfully, like using this to try to manipulate people to give you money. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 
but by manifestation of the truth. Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. We who are of the church of the living God, manifesting the truth that is in us because we are sealed until the day, the day of redemption. We have the Lord Jesus Christ living within us. So what does that mean? We're walking our talk. We are walking according to the scriptures, okay? Walking by example, living by example, speaking, okay? But have renounced the things of dishonesty, not handling, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, little g, and this it's different because it is the, uh, uh, 1611. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Remember all that bright shining light? Remember that? Okay? All that bright shining light? In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto them. Okay? God, uh, the God of this world, the little G God of this world, is Satan. Your father, those of you who are lost. He is your father, the God of this world, okay? And you got to remember, too, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, that we that are of the church of the living God, we were in your position. We were once you. We were once lost sinners, we are now saved sinners, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Those who are saved, born again, converted, new creatures in Christ Jesus, we are made alive, okay? We were once dead, like you guys. You lost people. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. Where in time past, Ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's you. You hear the true gospel and reject it. You're a child of disobedience. Among, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. See, and look at that. Fulfilling the flesh, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, earthly, sensual, devilish. See, you reject the true gospel. You reject our Lord Jesus Christ. You reject the scriptures, okay? You reject God. You're a child of disobedience. You're a child of wrath. The love of God is not for you. Okay, the love of God is at Calvary. Go there on his terms. Don't be a thief and a robber climbing up some other way. No, go to the Lord on his terms. Okay, his terms, not your own. Oh, beg your pardon, brother. His terms, not your own. Because if you don't, you are a child of wrath. God's wrath, the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what you are facing. That's what awaits you. Okay? And also, the prince of the power of the air. We got to remember, brethren, brethren, we also have to remember Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Because remember, unto Satan has this world been given for judgment. And he is the little G-God of this world. Okay? And what does Satan offer to you lost people? All this will I give you. If you fall down and worship me, all will be mine. Because all this I can give it to whomever I want. 
ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yeah. And Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Okay. Satan, who is the little g-god of this world, is also what? Revelation chapter 12. Verses 9 on to verse 11. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of our brethren, is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Yes, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Okay? He is an accuser. He is a deceiver. He works in he works in earth. He works in skin, flesh. Okay? This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay? And this is in the book of Revelation, which is for the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? That is when Satan gets kicked out during the time of Jacob's trouble. <coughs> and because, you know, right now, today, you know, he's walking to and fro on the earth, you know, walking to and fro. First Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Because also to remember, dear friend, remember, dear friend, in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, go back there, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 on to verse 15. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, son of the morning. All those stones, those bright stones, blinding light, Sin is to made to look so beautiful. Hmm? And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Ministers of righteousness. Like I've told you before, uh, for those within, you know, false prophets here on YouTube and other platforms, these Christians in their buildings and stuff like that. But ministers of righteousness, doctors, Jesuit trained doctors, Jesuit trained lawyers, hmm? ministers of righteousness. Ministers of righteousness. And, and let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 and 15, on to verse 15. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you ministers of righteousness. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering in, entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widow, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye can pass sea and land to make 
one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Yes, these converts to easy believism, uh, lordship salvation, and these ecumenical nuts, <laughs> and these uh, evolutionist people, okay? They make what? Ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Got to be careful what you believe, dear, dear friend, okay? Be very careful. And go to Galatians chapter 6. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We want verses 12 on to verse 16. As many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Join us. Come with us. Give. Uh, let us all have one purse, okay? Follow us. Be with us. Think like we think, okay? Why? As many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh. Fair shoe in the flesh? Satan uh, savor us not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Put on a good facade that their countenance, you know, that they look look bright and shiny. Ministers of righteousness. Yeah. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Hmm. They don't walk their talk. They don't do as they, they don't practice what they preach. But if they can get you, oh, they're going to glory that they got you. That your eyes have been opened. And now you are as gods and can know good and evil. But God forbid, now for us, here's the answer to this. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. See, we have the church of the living God. We're dead unto this world. And if our Lord saves you, you will be dead unto this world. And go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verses 1 under verse 4. Verses 1 under verse 4 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. To establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Brethren, when we're, as we go on further, as we get closer and closer to the redemption of the purchased possession, we can't be troubled by these things. We know that they're coming, okay? We're going to encounter more and more of these people asking foolish and unlearned questions. We're going to encounter more and more infiltrators. And the falling away, you know, they who say they are of us but are not of us, but they were made manifest that they are not of us. Oh, you just wait. You just wait. You just wait. It's going to get far more worse as this year continues alone. Okay? That no man should be moved by these afflictions. Don't be moved. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer, that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Why? Because we're crucified unto the world. We don't go as according to the world's standard. We go according to God's standard. Okay? We're not of this world. We're in the world. But we're not of this world. And 
and go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 12 on to verse 21. Okay? Now, if you ever get an opportunity to be used of the Lord, and um, used of the Lord to guide someone onto himself through the Romans road, okay? Through the book of Romans, that is. By the time you get to Romans chapter 5, you're going to know, by the time you read, uh, go through Romans chapter 5 with this individual, you're going to know with whom you are dealing with. Whether they are going to be submissive, whether they are going to choose life, or whether they're going to be closed. Romans chapter 5, verses 12. Unto the close of the chapter. Wherefore, now, see this, uh, some people it's like, well, we're all sinners. We don't have a choice. God has given you a choice to choose him or to stay in bondage to Satan. See, see, these guys will say, because we're all born sinners, according to you, right? We're all born sinners, so we don't have a choice. We're born a sinner. And that is true. We are born sinners, but see, you have a choice. See, you have a choice. You can stay in bondage to Satan, or you can be humbled and broken and go to the Lord on his terms and come to him broken and contrite and in fear of him. Call upon his name and ask him to forgive you. Okay? You have a choice. Okay? Romans chapter 5, verses 12 on to verse 21. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Remember, they didn't die instantly. It was gradual. Okay? So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Yes, because we all descend from Adam and Eve. Okay? Hence, because of the fall, we are all born sinners. Yes. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law, because by the knowledge of law comes sin. You didn't know that uh, not to covet unless the law said not to covet. Okay? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. What does that mean? They didn't sin like Adam sinned. But yet they're still counted sinners. Why? Because we are all descended from Adam. Okay? Who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace. The gift by grace. Look at that. The gift by grace. Which is by one man, Jesus Christ. Hath abounded unto many. That gift by grace. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses on to justification. So what is this saying? And not as, as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. One that sinned, Adam. So is the gift, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. Condemnation after the uh, sin of Adam. Okay? But the free gift is of, a, of many offenses, and he was offended, endured many offenses. God manifest in the flesh. Okay? He endured many offenses, but he didn't sin. Unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, the gift of righteousness, imputed righteousness, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. See, 
an easy believism devil who saves himself by his own belief, that's your own righteousness. I'm saved because I believe. Bravo, you're going to hell. Or the ecumenical, I, God saw something good in me, so he saved me. You know, God so loved the world. He loved me, right? No. Yeah. He loved you, past tense. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't love you, present tense. His love is at Calvary. There, at Calvary, okay? All right? <laughs> so, therefore, as by the... Uh, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundant grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. See, when you come to the Lord broken and contrite and in fear of him, call upon his name, there's no room for your righteousness. His righteousness is, is imputed unto you. But if you are one of those devils who boot the door, okay, so you can climb up some other way, Easy believism, you're saved by your belief, your righteousness. Your ecumenical um, love gospel, God loves you, present tense. God loves something in you, saw something good in you to die for you, meaning you're a good person. Your self-righteousness, uh, lordship salvation, you give up all this stuff and then God saves you, your righteousness. No, no. Evolution, your brain, right? Yeah. See, brokenness, repentance, is necessary. It is a requirement for salvation. Because if you're not broken, how is he going to fix you? Shall receive uh, much more they which receive abundance, grace, and of the gift of righteousness. Whose righteousness? His shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. But, but see, remember, it's not a, a force. God's not going to force salvation on anyone. There are those out there who's like, well, everybody's going to be saved. No. God's salvation is there for everyone. Yes, but not everyone is going to go to him on his terms. No, they want to boot the door out of the way. Yeah. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Talking about Adam. Even so, by the righteousness of one, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. The free gift of salvation is there. God's salvation is there to be had. You just got to go to him the way he prescribes. Broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, call upon his name. For as by one man's disobedience... Many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. You wouldn't know what sin was until the law was there. The law was there to show you that you can't save yourself. At your best, your vanity. You can't keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. No man can. Jesus Christ is come. In the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Could. The only man who could was God. He's the only one who could keep the commandments perfectly. You and I never can. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned on uh, that as sin hath reigned on to death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. But ultimately we have to remember it's free will. And what has happened? Romans chapter one, verse twenty-five. 
Hmm. These people, these evolutionists, these people who reject God, who reject the truth. Hmm. Romans chapter 1 verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Hmm. Brethren, brethren, people, we know what the scripture says about these times that are coming upon us. Okay? Like we are warned in Timothy, 2 Timothy. <clears throat> Verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous times are coming. Divers are hardened. Men don't want truth. They want to believe alive. Therefore, God will, will send them strong delusion because they receive not the love of the truth. If you're not saved, if you're lost, and you've made it through this. Let us reason together, you and I. Okay? Let us reason together, you and I. About where you're going to go. Who is God? And that you're not a good person, no matter what you want to believe. And that whether or not you want to accept it or not, you are going to give an account to our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. See, you have choice. See, we're all born sinners. Yes, we are. But see, God has provided you a way out. God has given you the answer. And it is Jesus Christ. But Satan comes along. Satan, no, no. Here, I'll give you all these other options. Just don't choose this one. Man has free will. And if anyone comes along telling you or preaching against free will, they are of the devil himself. And brethren, remember Titus 3.10. He that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. It's not our job to be apologists. What a wicked term. We are to give an answer of the hope that is in us unto every man. We are not to answer every man's questions because most of the time those questions will lead into what? Strife and debate. So. That is going to be it for this video. Um, thank you for enduring this if you have. Um, thank you so much, brethren. Thank you to all of you for your prayers and for everything that you have done. Thank you so much. We love you so very much we pray for so many of you um thank you thank you um got uh got some other videos coming this week obviously obviously uh some pretty oh uh some collaborated efforts uh some collaborated efforts are coming this week so uh keep an eye out for them going to be some pretty good videos lord willing Thank you, brethren, for watching this. If you do, and again, you lost people, please consider these things. We have free will. And unless you are of the church of the living God, your father is the devil. Repent. Come to him on his terms and be ye saved. So, anyway, that is going to be it. We love you. Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, um, pray for one another. Pray for us. And we will see you in the next video.